we can still do public comments. I'm hoping to, uh, I'm hoping to put uh, some introductions from our new faces up front, um, and then we can still uh, give the presentation about the right of way and trespass um, changes that were made six months ago or so. Just that change that and thought she unlocked it. Locked. It got locked. <laughs> Are you the mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, We can uh, still do the Chief's report, <coughs> discussion, yeah. and recap. Um, but with that, welcome to Lindsay and Amanda. Uh, do you want to start by introducing yourself, Lindsay? Sure, so my name's Lindsay Foltz. I'm here tonight um, from the Civilian Review Board. I'm a longtime Eugene resident, as they like to call us salmon children. So I was born here and went away for a number of years and uh, served in the Peace Corps, lived in Central Oregon for a while, and then came back to raise my kids here. Um, I'm currently in a PhD program at the U of O um, studying anthropology. And I worked for five years for the Human Rights Commission, so I used to interact with this board as a staff person, but I'm glad to be here as civilian. <laughs> Hi, so thank you for having me. I'm uh, Amanda McCluskey. Um, I've never heard that term, salmon children before, but I am also one. Um, <laughs> born and raised in the area around Eugene, Springfield, and Walterville, so upriver a little bit. Um, moved to Seattle for a couple years and then came back. Um, I went to University of Oregon. I have a son. Um, I currently work at HIV Alliance, and I've been there for 13 years. Um, I am the director of programs, so I oversee all of our prevention, care, behavioral health, and education programs. Um, we operate in Lane County as well as 32 counties in Oregon all together, so all over the place. Um, and oh, I also I left HIV Alliance for two years and worked for Lane County in the Human Services Division. So, um, and I'm just very recent to Human Rights Commission. I have been to uh, one meeting so far. So, awesome. Well, as you guys are probably aware the council hasn't appointed you yet, so you don't have a vote, which is why we're having trouble with quorum. Um, and for the folks who just arrived, because we don't have quorum, uh, we, we won't be taking any votes, but we'll still be seeing the presentation, still taking public comment. Um, so let us begin with that uh, public comment. Majeska is first on that list. Um, we'll be right down at the end. Hello, my desk is C-screen. Most of you at the table have seen me a number of times, except you. <laughs> <laughs> um, as you know, I've been following police commission stuff for 17 or 18 years, I'm especially interested in the issues that overlap with homelessness issues, and I have tried to kind of keep track of what kind of discussion and processing is going on here uh, regarding public safety. And and those difficult issues. And I haven't been paying that much attention the last few months, and I see on today's agenda you got lots of stuff related to that. And um, I keep telling myself, I'll, oh, I'll catch up, I'll watch the videos and uh, look at the packets, and I so appreciate that the police department does the, the videos and post them. Um, but I guess this time around I'll be doing more of an audit of what y'all did um, rather than following it. And, current time, but I, I did inquire when I got here if you, if your discussions have ever been touching on the subject of uh, should you consider making a recommendation to city council to change some of the actual wording in the ordinances regarding the stuff that you're talking about, policies of implementing. And um, what I got from just quickly asking is, you know, you really haven't gotten into those kind of discussions, and when it does come up, it <coughs> doesn't get much traction. So I want to say, please, think about that more. When you revisit these topics, think about more, because otherwise it says something about where you all are coming from if you think the ordinances don't even need tweaking. And we need groups like yours to help make recommendations about what would be in the community interest to do that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, for general record keeping, uh, since we do have so many new faces, you have, um, this is public comment, so we can't respond directly. Um, but during the discussion pieces, raise your hand. Uh, Jeremy or I will take you down and we'll go in order. Can't hear you. I, uh, I. Uh, Yell. 
<laughs> Will do. All right. So next person, uh, Simone. Oh, okay. I have no idea what I'm going to say. I thought you guys were going to do a bunch of discussing, and then we figure out what we want to say. So this is my first experience with a police team, and it's like sort of intimidating, to be honest with you, because I'm a mental health person, and I've been homeless. I've never really been harassed by the cops. Um, I guess I, so I, a question would be like, is there plans to, um, what, are, what are we gonna do? Like, at this point, I know that there's a group of kids, they're like 20, 17 to 20, they're like harassing elderly homeless people, and they harass people downtown, you know, like, that's police business. You know, these people are already disabled and vulnerable, and they're being targeted, so that's something that needs to be addressed, you know? And like it shouldn't be a civilian responsibility to interact with people like this, and and we need to figure out how we're going to help these people. And we all know it affects businesses and it affects the potential beautification process of downtown Eugene, which I went to that thing and I think it's all wonderful and beautiful and I think it would be really beneficial. But we also have to think about like what are we going to do? Just put these people somewhere and kill them? Because they exist, and their problems aren't going anywhere, and and so what do we do? It's just like I mean, I went to that Pat Hadley um, thing where she got a ticket. She's disabled. She's elderly. She has mental health issues. Like to me, I felt like that whole thing was a waste of money and time. And then we did a little protest thing, and a guy stepped off the sidewalk, and two cops were there right away to give him a ticket that he's never going to be able to pay because he's homeless. So to me, all of that just makes no sense. No sense at all. And it just seems like it's wasting the people of Eugene's time and energy and money to something that we need to be having solution-based dialogue about. Because it's not, it's, it's not a problem that's going somewhere. And I actually have friends that are elderly, a lot of elderly friends that are housed, and they're very close to one paycheck away to not being housed anymore. So like we have all these homeless people, but if we don't address the fact there's no low income housing, because I'm in low income housing at Umbrella Properties, and they keep raising our rent and not doing any maintenance or any security or anything, and we have nowhere to go if we get evicted or if we you know miss a paycheck or something. Where are we gonna go? There's no place to rent. And there are lots of people that are on the edge like that, and as Eugene becomes more and more gentrified, we're going to find our most vulnerable populations homeless, including the elderly and single mothers with children and single fathers with children. So I guess that's what I have to say. So, okay. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. Yes. Yeah. Um, next, I think it's <coughs> Fran. Dad? Yes. Um, I'm a retired physician, uh, moved up from California. Uh, and I am currently technically homeless because I'm living in my travel trailer uh, with permission in a friend's backyard. So, and I have, St. Vinny's has been very helpful. They give me a, my own porta potty and trash can, which I'm grateful for. Um, but when I was a physician, I was never particularly focused on the money. I was more interested in trying to bring up the lower strata, social strata of people to a better position. Um, this did not go over real well in Eureka, California, uh, where I irritated a whole lot of officials by expressing my opinion plainly and often uh, to those in power. And I have to say, if we can declare that the homeless situation is an emergency, then I believe it says in the rules somewhere that we can waive the camping prohibition because you aren't doing people any good to move their camp or take everything away from them and throw it away and that they start back at ground zero once again. People who are camping are trying to take care of themselves. Um, the overall problem is more financial and it's much bigger than just Eugene. It's nationwide, it's worldwide. Um, and we need to bend the rules from the more controlling where they have been into the more compassionate where they need to go because we are all human. And being homeless is not the fault 
of someone who finds themselves in that situation, especially when prices keep going up and the financial system keeps thinking that we need to expand more and, and uh, manufacture more and bomb more and destroy more and pollute more and that is a dead end solution. Um, we need to move back towards compassion. And um, on the one hand, most of us have some sense of how being practical is really necessary to get through life. And controls are an attempt to be practical. On the other hand, most of us also have a sense that compassion is really necessary. And if you leave out the compassion and you get nothing but control, you get over control, you get fascism, I don't want to see us go that way. 20 seconds remaining. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you so much for your comments. Um, next, uh, Wayne Martin. Thanks for uh, having this time to hear from uh, the public. Um, I moved here seven years ago, retired from a position as a clergyman for 35 years. And I didn't know exactly what I was going to do with my retirement. And I'm not the first one to face that issue. About seven months into my stay here, I was asked to come to a meeting of the steering committee for Opportunity Village. And while that was a success, and we're happy that's up and running, I've gone on to other things, but I haven't stopped the basic uh, conviction and the call to uh, do whatever I can to alleviate the pain and suffering of homeless people, including attempting to change ordinances. Just a quick thing. Today, um, I was part of a conference that the county paid for. And there were about 250 of us there. And the intent of that and tomorrow's version of the conference is to, overall, to implement the program of the Technical Assistance Collaborative Report out of Boston, which was a thorough study of Eugene. And uh, it makes sense that they are now putting their energy into looking for solutions. It makes sense in the light of that to begin building the relationship between the law enforcement industry, pardon me, that's not the right word, is it? Uh, profession and calling. People are called to do this, and those who do it well are especially called. And uh, the homeless population. What I admire most about EPD is that it takes its calling seriously to protect citizens by following the law. That means a lot. I feel better protected because of it. I think the law that was put in during the Grateful Dead days, prohibiting camping and with good reason then, has come to a point where there is little reason related to those days to continue having the ordinance. So I'm going to ask if My friend, Chief Skinner, who I interviewed for this job, louder. one of many, louder, I don't do louder. <laughs> um, <coughs> time is up. Oh, I just wanted to end then with this. I'd like to see if there could be a small task force that could be focused on the relationships between people streeting, sleeping on the streets other homeless people who are not sleeping on the streets, and some of us activists, and currently I'm trying to demilitarize activists. If we could put a small uh, uh, task group together to discuss the 
relationship between the ordinance and what we might do to provide a difference in the ordinance, I think we would be appreciated. Okay. And thanks. Thank again. you so much. <coughs> With that, we will uh, we will go into commissioner comments. And we'll go around the table clockwise. Um, save you for the Houston report. Sweet. Will pass. Um, I think I'll pass. Just a, a welcome to Lindsay and Amanda, and um, I'm good. Well, I, I really appreciate you coming. You know, all of you to come and share what you thought about. You know, policies that we are. Um, charged to you know recommend to, to the chief and to the city council so um, thank you you're well silver pass pass all right um, I don't really have anything else to say I'm gonna have a little bit of trouble writing um, but we still don't have quorum and I think we'll go on from there Moving the review later, uh, trespass right away discussion. Is that decent? So, that's actually going to be this is Becky DeWitt. Becky DeWitt, welcome. Hey, thank you. Can yes. I here? Yes, please. She's the director of the city. Uh, if you care to introduce yourself to Absolutely, everybody. Absolutely, certainly. Hi, my name is Becky DeWitt. I am the division manager for the city manager's office with the city of Eugene. So, um, first of all, I just want to thank you all for the work that you do in advising um, council and the chief um, related to any number of issues. And I just want to express on behalf of council just the appreciation for the work that you do and the heart that you bring to that. Um, and for those of you that, that help us to help inform the work. So, thank you. Um, Sounds, um, my understanding is that this body is looking at recommendations related to po the policies responding for illegal, responding to illegal camping for ETD. And uh, the, the request for me was to come and talk about the planting strip ordinance um, and some of the impacts that we've seen um, related to that, that are from a non policing standpoint, but also from a policing standpoint. Um, and certainly, I'll obviously reflect or uh, refer a lot of the policing questions to Carolyn Lieutenant Mason, who um, has been an incredibly good partner in terms of helping to um, address any number of things related to illegal camping in our organization. Um, first and foremost, I thought it'd be helpful to provide some context um, in terms of what the city and the county are doing. Wayne, I appreciate you being here and referring to um, the, the um, offsite that the county is doing, the community offsite Likewise. that they're doing related to um, the TAC response. The city is actually partnering with Lane County um, related to all of the things that we can be doing to help improve our overall services to the homeless within um, the city of Eugene. Um, as you know, Lane County is the body that provides the mental health services and the health and human services to that. And um, over the past five or six years, the city has taken on more of a role to provide some of the things that that, that system has been unable to provide, such as um, temporary um, camping um, under the camp, the car camping program with St. Vincent de Paul, as well as the Dust to Dawn site, as well as helping to um, try some new programs, such as the rest stops that you may be familiar with. So, in addition to that, um, with the impetus of the TAC, the city's also, and um, council's also, um, has delegated $1.9 million to help also. Um, implement the TAC recommendations and so we're in close partnership to do that and so with the goal of really providing services to the unhoused and create some systems efficiencies so that um, those that are unhoused can move um, to a situation that's better for them and so I just wanted to highlight that in addition to that the community safety initiative does have some um, money set aside to do some um, services for the homeless as well and so just wanted to make sure that you all had that context in addition to this work and I apologize if I'm repetitive to things that you may already know on that so the planning strip ordinance um, did come forward to council and was considered by them and did pass on June 25th and um, as you all probably saw in your packet the primary um, primary thing that the planning strip ordinance provides for is those individuals and property owners that are responsible for maintaining the right-of-way planting strips um, adjacent to their property it provides them the ability to also have the authority to trespass somebody from 
that property. And so um, their, uh, their responsibility to maintain that has been consistently there for um, a number of years, but this does provide that um, ability to trespass. Because we knew that that was coming, um, our city has um, a new team that is a cross-functional team that I'm leading within the rest of the city that includes members of all of our departments, including EPD and Public Works, um, who do respond to illegal camping as well as our planning and development and other departments. Um, we call it our homelessness operations team, and our goal of that team is to work together so that we're more efficient and more effective in our responses to all complaints is also sharing information so that we can actually um, make sure that we're um, giving information to those that are homeless to help move them to services as well as share information related to how can we better respond to complaints from our community members and provide education and information along the way. And so knowing that this ordinance was coming up, the team did quite a bit of work together to map where the current camps that were going to be impacted by the ordinance that may not be aware that it was coming, and then send teams of outreach teams of people out to um, those individuals that were camping in those planning strips to let them know that this ordinance was coming and provide some social service information, et cetera. And so um, that education effort was largely very successful. It helped um, a number of individuals know that it was coming. And what we've seen since then um, is just primarily voluntary compliance. And, um, and we've also seen a little bit of an uptick or some uptick in more camping in the rights of way that actually don't have a planting strip. So for example, anywhere where there's just sidewalk. And so we've seen more of an uptick in that, um, those types of um, camping. And so that complaints, those complaints are continuing to come in. Um, related to those, those camping spots, a lot of the complaints that we're getting um, are, is, include everything from concerns around the biohazards that people are observing, um, potentially blocking of the sidewalk or access to parking or other or other things as well as um, in some cases some harassing behavior um, and a, a feeling of, of lack of safety and so we have had an uptick in some of those types of complaints and Lieutenant Mason can speak to that so that's been one of our um, I think I wouldn't say it was an unanticipated impact but it's definitely been what I would say from a citywide perspective the biggest impact that we've seen there hasn't been as much movement into the parks um, and I think that was one of the impacts that we thought would happen but in, in speaking with our parks and open space director they said there hasn't been as much movement um, of camping there and then we also um, I think I'd mentioned that we have some overnight sites such as the mission um, which is independently operated as well as the dust to dawn site which has 192 beds out at highway 99 operated by st vincent de paul um, that actually filled up more quickly this year this is our first year that we've done a year round um, and so that did fill up more quickly this year um, than it typically would have or than we would have anticipated so in the summer it averaged around 157 people per night and then um, in September it could have been because of the rain it could have been any other number of factors it, it is full at 192 at this point so um, that's those are kind of the primary impacts so I think that's really what I have to share I'm definitely open to hearing any questions that you all have and, and fielding anything that I can and or um, following up with more information if you'd like does anybody have any questions so far a lot to process for folks. Um, well, again, thank you so much for coming in. Uh, I will take the opportunity to remember a question that I heard me ask like you. Nope, I lost it. Anybody else? Yeah, well, we have 60 minutes on this, right, Sean? Yep. Exactly. So let's not, let's not rush it. <laughs> I have a lot of questions. Okay. Sweet. Uh, silver and then V. Mm -hmm. um, what can happen to a person if they're caught not compliant to being on a plant strip? That would actually be Much best for Lieutenant Mason to respond to. <laughs> 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 um, if so, our practice is to um, at first warn the person that they're on a planning strip where somebody has made a complaint and they're the lawful owner and ask them to move, which 
99.9% of the time the game's compliance and they, they leave. Uh, if they refuse to leave, then we have the option of issuing a citation and or making an arrest. And to my knowledge, based on my, re my report that I just got, we've had 72 complaints since uh, June 6th of, we call them curb easement trespassing. It's a criminal trespass charge versus a camping charge. Um, it is citable and arrestable, as I said, with the goal of gaining compliance through warning. I think I looked on here and we had one listed as an arrest. I didn't get a chance to actually look at the case, but I would be willing to bet that it would be probably a warrant versus someone actually being arrested for refusing to leave the curb strip. But I can follow up on that if you would like that information. I, I did want to know if there were any arrests that came out of it. I'll have to I'll okay. have to follow up with the particular report. There was one listed as an arrest, but like I said, I'm I'm not sure if it was actually because of the actual complaint or whether it was a, a warrant check. Okay, great. Um, as I understand it, the city needs to provide some sort of a shelter or space for people that are homeless before they can start making arrests based upon Please, yes. these types of uh, situations. What is the situation that is being observed that makes it so that's the case? So is it the, the mission? Or is there other areas that are, that are <coughs> options for homeless people to go to that makes it so that <coughs> we can be in compliant with the fact that we don't have any other spaces for them to go? I think it's somewhat more complex with that. I think what you're referring sure to is the Ninth Circuit case related yeah. to Boise. Um, there are some things related to our illegal camping um, ordinance that actually Boise doesn't necessarily apply to um, <coughs> because uh, just illegal camping in and of itself is not a violation um, or is a violation, it's not an arrestable offense. Um, so there are some pieces related to that um, that come into play from that standpoint. I don't want to step out of my lane and give the full advice that the city attorney would give on that though because I'm not an attorney. Right. So I will jump in and add that when they're when we're looking at facing an arrest for a prohibited camping type situation, a willful violation or otherwise, uh, one of the tools that we do use is that we call the St. Vinny's hotline, which they post the number of beds available. Mm -hmm. And if all through the summer until very recently they've had more than enough beds. Well, I won't say more than enough. They have had beds available to deal with the people that we've Thanks. encountered. Uh, can I get a point of order uh, real quick? So we can't take comments from, uh, from everybody now. However, um, you can send more comments and questions to Jeremy by email or fill out another blue sheet that he can take afterwards. Um, thank you so much. And so um, regarding wet beds, I know there was a discussion about Eugene opening up with wet, some wet beds some time ago. That never happened. And so what are we doing at this point to make sure that that's an option for people that are going through that process? Sure. So if you're meaning by wet beds, if you're meaning um, where a drug screen and sobriety is not required, right. or um, so just a low barrier or a low barrier shelter, yeah. um, we do have Dust to Dawn is, is a low barrier shelter, um, and by the barri the only barrier that's in place there is behavioral expectations. So, uh, we have more. Let's go to V and then okay. to more so that we can come back. Thanks. My question is more uh, in, in regards to accessibility on sidewalks. Um, I'm up in the hills, and mm -hmm. I have a sidewalk in front of my house. You know, but then you walk a little bit further down, and all of a sudden the sidewalk ends mm -hmm. in the middle of the block. Um, how? I mean, have, has the city seen any kind of complaints from uh, people with disability? You know, uh, complaining that it's not wheelchair accessible, or you know, blind individuals who are walking with with their canes and they suddenly, you know, couldn't. Uh, yeah, it's sure. just it, it can be very inhibiting, and then. Um, in, I, I moved here recently from San Francisco. We had a program there called um, Sidewalks are for Everyone. Um, and that means, you know, you know, people with wheelchairs, people with, you know, using white canes, uh, or people with their, you know, uh, 
kids, you know, riding their, you know, tricycle, whatever, mm -hmm. you know, they should be able to access it, you know, without any anything that suddenly ends, you know, when yeah. when they're expecting more concrete or pavement to go on. Um, <clears throat> but I, I notice here there's that doesn't seem to be the case. I mean, it could be, is it up to the owners to put a sidewalk, or is it up to the city to mandate that they put the sidewalk there yeah. in front of the home? So, so not related to Plan D, or not related right, to Campy, right. but just the sidewalks in general. I would actually have to follow up with our transportation engineers okay, related to thanks. that. So yeah, I'm sorry that it's not on sure. the same topic, but sure. it's something that has been on my mind. You oh, know. Great. I'll give you my um, card at the end, okay, and then thanks. we can connect, and I'll connect you with the right person. Okay, I appreciate it. Thank Absolutely. you. I'm going to put myself on the queue, unless anybody else wants to jump in. Um, uh, but going off the accessibility angle for this and how it relates to specifically to the right of way discussion, the accessibility was already a, a uh, not a violation, but it was already something that the police were concerned about and could move folks along as a result of, correct? That is correct. I think that um, I'll let you speak to it, but I believe there is a certain level of passage that needs to be able to have there needs to be a certain level of passage on right. the sidewalk. So uh, blocked sidewalk calls, a lot of times uh, campers may be partially on the sidewalk, or even not, e not even campers, just oh, people are going to congregate on the sidewalks. And uh, the state has an ordinance called pedestrians, which the city has adopted as their uh, statute. And what it entails is that um, anybody knowingly blocking a sidewalk is in violation and it is technically an arrestable offense. But for us, and we just had this conversation recently with the city attorney about this, because we get a lot of calls for this with the population expecting us to come and move these people. And in fact, we can't because the, as again, I said, the ordinance indicates that they have to knowingly be blocking the sidewalk. And for me as an officer to be able to prove that they are knowingly doing that is a fairly high, well, the highest um, level of probable cause that I have to get, or the, um, what's the word I want here, Chief? Burden of proof. Burden of proof, thank you. Culpable mental yes, state. Yes, the mental <laughs> state, drawn a blank. I have no mental state. <laughs> so for us to do that is pretty much impractical. Um, I don't think that people knowingly, intentionally intend to block the sidewalk. So the best that we're able to do in those situations, and often is, again, a warning and they clear a pathway and that's kind of goes to what you're saying as well as if the you know 88 uh, abilities for wheelchairs and other folks to get through uh, right now the city attorney is telling us if there's ample room for a pedestrian or person to go through on the sidewalk um, around these people then they aren't blocking and we have no legal basis to move them um, I think there's a work group that's going to be starting up to talk about uh, what the ADA legal responsibilities are for, for maintaining a certain percentage or uh, amount with on the <coughs> sidewalk, mm -hmm. which may change our response to blocking sidewalks or people taking up vast quantities of it. Does that explain? Mm -hmm. That answers my, my question. <coughs> Lindsay? So just to clarify, I think you said this, that it's a complaint-driven system, so it's not something that's yeah. proactively enforced. It's something that's reactively enforced based on the property owners calling to complain. Back to the planning strip. Yes. yes. Sorry, back to the planning yeah. strip. <laughs> um, if a neighbor calls and it's not on their property, can that does that neighbor have the right to complain, or is it just the property owner themselves? So you'd have no. to like go through the process of verifying. Right. So our dispatch center has been trained, if yeah. you will, to inquire when people call in complaining about it. They'll gather the information about the location. They can actually pull up the Arlen sure. database and look at the property lines. They can see, see who calling. the property owner is and confirm that they are, in fact, the person. If, if it's a third-party complaint, then it's not popping onto our screen. And if people, what if people are renting or renters? They protected? are not considered owners. So okay. because technically they're not responsible for the maintenance or yep. the, up, uh, yep. the upkeep of that area. It would go, it wouldn't be a curb easement call for a criminal trespass response, but it would go into a camping on the right of way call. Got it. Different mm -hmm. category. Okay. Um, and actually, I just received a document uh, from the city attorney to convey an owner's authority to a agent, mm -hmm. if you will. Mm -hmm. um, it's really long legalese <laughs> document. 
uh, which so that will maybe help us in some instances, uh, especially with property management or uh, owners who are out of town or out yeah. of country even in some instances. Yeah work much like a letter of trespass per se mm -hmm. but again it would still require that agent or that owner to call each and every time mm -hmm. not just not we're going to get yeah we're yeah. not just going to come and yeah. watch your property all the time Makes thank you i've got myself in the queue next um me the silver uh, so one of the things that was on our work plan as a commission was uh, looking at potential uh, court expansion and I was wondering if this would be the how how this ordinance interacts with court particularly in the downtown corridor that was an, something we could point of clarification yes okay. court as in the criminal justice system C -O -R -T. Or the, okay or the community outreach response yes team. Okay. thank you um it's related to the downtown core, I guess one thing I probably should have mentioned is there is a downtown activity zone mm -hmm. that includes a lot of the downtown core, and so there's additional regulations that potentially apply to that. Um, so that's just an aside. Could you repeat your question again? I'm trying to check on uh, that. So one of the things that, as a commission, we're looking at uh, doing eventually is making some recommendation about uh, taking the successive we've successes we've seen with the. Uh, community outreach yes. and expanding them uh, to other areas of the city or sure. or what have you. So it's in the future for us. Mm -hmm. I, I was just wondering if you could give us a, a bit of information about how it, um, how this <coughs> right-of-way trespass currently interacts with the CORT um, where it does exist. So I, I don't know necessarily the answer to that. What I do know is um, in working with Sergeant Smith and some of the um, sites that she's found for those court um, Conestoga huts, um, I've worked with her to help identify some of those and connect her with individuals um, for where those can be cited. Um, that has been very successful, and I think the more we're able to have sites like that, the more we're able to have sites like the rest stop programs that are happening throughout the city, um, and the more we're able to even, so say for example, if a business or a faith-based community wanted to host, um, um, wanted to host a campsite under the city's ordinance, um, they could do that, um, either via car camping or they could purchase a Conestoga hut to do that. So um, to that end, I think the more places that we can have that are safe um, for people to go to and stay, that's helpful. Um, in relation to um, how many people on the planting strips would be eligible for the court program, I actually don't have a sense of that. So in terms of if there would be any related impacts. Thank you for so, but I, <laughs> I, it's an excellent program. I've heard really good feedback on it. Um, so the fire department, every time I talk with them, they're really happy with um, with the three ones that are Conestoga heads that are on their property. So it's an excellent program. Silver, <clears throat> um, you said 1.9 million is going to implement the TAC. How, in what ways, could you tell us that is happening? Certainly. So the council has set aside 1.9 million, and um, the TAC has 10 recommendations. Um, eight of those recommendations are primarily systems recommendations and systems efficiency recommendations, and those are all really within the purview of Lane County. Um, and so in terms of the coordinated entry system, diversion, and some other things that can help, um, that are really some <coughs> systems recommendations that come into play with that. The two recommendations that are remaining um, are emergency shelter, so uh, 75 bed um, emergency shelter is on the list is something that is a recommendation as well as 350 units of permanent supportive housing and so the city and the county are partnering on hiring what's called the strategic implementation manager we haven't come up with a better name for it so we're open to suggestions or advice related to that um, that would help implement some of the recommendations related to that including shelter <coughs> siting and operations as well as um, additional spots to build permanent supportive housing in, um, in the city so that as the county increases their efficiency there's more places for people to go so it's really it's a huge need that we have in our community so when that positions hired on that that person will be looking at some of that budget and 
Correct. Yeah, so, well, and actually, you're, at this point in time, council has made some decisions around how they would like some of that 1.9 million allocated. Um, 175,000 per year is towards um, the hiring and um, administration for that strategic implementation manager to be able to work um, on that. And again, that 175 is just the allocation. That's not the salary that the individual would have. It's the allocation so that they can they can do that work. So council has allocated that for 175 per year for three years. And then in addition to that, they've allocated some money towards the development of a pilot mobile outreach team. I believe that number is around 150,000 um, in the first year. And so right now my team is working on what would that pilot look like? And if it's effective, how could it potentially be um, absorbed into the coordinated entry system without all of the federal um, restrictions that that Health and Human Services needs to work with. And so we're working on developing a, um, something that's creative to really make sure that we have a mobile outreach team that's effective in reaching people that may not have otherwise been effectively reached. Um, to do that, um, all our team member has been engaging with the unhoused um, and a large number of um, community members of the unhoused who are helping to advise what that would look like, what would be effective for them. And then they also, um, we did a pilot program where we um, employed some of those that are unhoused to go out with some additional team members and then they did some outreach and then have reported that back to us so that we can kind of help inform what could that look like that would look and feel different and feel more accessible to people so that's what some of that 150 that's what that 150 is going toward there's also some money set aside for landlord engagement to help with incent landlords to um, to work with the unhoused more than maybe they are at this point in time. So we're working on a landlord engagement program around that. And in addition, they set aside some money to help see what it would be to potentially build a shelter or a purchase a sprung structure, which is um, something I won't bore you with all the details of, but it's, it's a, a more cost effective yet still good option um, really that would be um, able to put a shelter up more quickly, but still be really effective. Like and a tent. <laughs> yeah, it's like a tent, but it's a really expensive, nice tent that really does have a really strong infrastructure where it stays warm, it stays dry, it can include, um, you know, everything That's that you would cool. need into in a bricks and mortar structure. So how does that diff? How is that different from the 75 units and the was it 350? Uh, yeah, so the, the, the sprung structure would be towards the seven, that would be the 75 bed okay. sprung structure or navigation center. Um, so we're looking at what that could look like. And again, that's also in partnership with the county. And we know that um, the cost will be even more than that, but that's what the this, um, city council has set aside to help see money for that so that we can not um, have to wait on budget allocations if we're able to move quickly on that. Can you talk a little bit more again about this 350? Permanent supportive housing, yes. So permanent supportive housing is um, supported housing for those individuals that are experiencing homelessness that includes things such as um, addiction services, mental health services, and other um, job training, et cetera. And the goal is it's, it's based on a housing first model. And that housing first model essentially says if you can get somebody into um, a place that's warm and dry and, and housed, then they then we, you can also provide some wraparound services and then help them address some of the issues that um, can set them up for success in the future. And so um, that's a large need in our community. There is a 55 bed permanent supporting house supportive housing unit going up over on MLK. So that's going to be built by the county and so um, and so we're again working um, with trying to figure out how can we speed up the process for that my understanding from our partners at the county is the MLK building from start to when it'll be done is a 10-year process and as we know that's too long um, and we need things more quickly and so part of the recommendations of the TAC is to really put somebody in place who can really help work with our community partners using collective impact to try to impact this and do things in possibly a different way than we've done them in the past, which is why we're really um, excited about the potential of hiring a strategic implementation manager to potentially work with all of our community partners, public and private businesses, advocates, et cetera, to figure out how can we do this work more quickly to more quickly serve those who are unhoused. Um. Just a reminder, we need to focus on what the police commission can actually do. 
Um, but with that, let's move on to Amanda. Okay, I have a handful of questions for you. Sure. And thank you. This is um, all your information is really helpful. I've been following pieces of this, so it's really helpful to hear all of it, um, how it all relates to each other. Great. Um, the questions I have for you, the 350 units of permanent supportive housing, are you, um, and this is probably going to depend on once you hire your, the manager for the position, but um, are you thinking of new, these are new units, not vouchers, correct? Correct. Okay, and you're looking at like construction or acquiring or? I think all of the above, and so the TAC recommendation, and this relates to the planning district ordinance from the standpoint of making sure that we have enough places for people to go. Yeah. Um, the TAC report identified that we don't have enough places for people who are on this, the waiting list to receive housing. Sure. We don't have enough places for that, and so um, the goal is to either between building or acquiring properties and converting them to, to get those 350. Great. Okay, and then the outreach, the mobile outreach teams that you referenced, is that related to the recent RFP that the county put out for the outreach teams, or is this separate? This is different from that. This is different from that. Okay. So the county is regularly engaged in outreach as part of what they need to do from a health and human services standpoint. However, they do get their funding, um, some federal funds, and so they have some restrictions to work within. Um, that as a city, because we don't, we're not in that business. We are, we don't have restrictions related to that, and so we're just trying to come up with: is there a model that they could potentially absorb into their system in the future that could also help it be more efficient? Great. And then my, my last question is um, regarding the ordinance. I did not have time. I glanced through it, um, but I was wondering if you could clarify if this creates any like obligation on the part of the property owner to report folks that are camping on the strip that they are um, in charge of or whatever. Um, like if they don't want to report someone for camping, does it create any sort of obligation on the property owner to report that person? It does not, no. Okay. They can they can choose to not report it and okay. that's fine. Okay. So thank you. So next on the queue I've got myself and then B. Uh, so my question is just bringing back uh, the the questions about those new shelters that we are building to uh, the interaction with the police. Are these going to be centralized or spread out, and how will that interact and impact police work? Um, as far as that, I, I don't know that I could predict how it would interact with police work. I think the intent is to provide a place for people to go where they would have the wraparound supports and systems that they would need um, in order for them to be able to um, not have as many engagements with police potentially as they would potentially have from any number of violations or other actions. Senator Mason, can you comment any more on that? Well, I, I think she hit the nail on the head that that's the intent. Um, when they're not living on the street in the public, having the interactions with the, the homeowners and the you know people, they're, they're going to do their stuff indoors or it's not going to be offensive to others. So it should reduce the amounts of efforts on our part as well. Thank you so much. V? Is there any uh, component to the ordinance that um, support in educating the public about what you know programs that are available for um, assisting those who are unhoused? Um, uh, for example, you know, I, I'm thinking of in terms of you know myself. I I knew very little a bit about you know home being you know unhoused until I had a housemate who was at one point unhoused. And uh, he was the best housemate out of all the housemates I've ever had in my whole life. You know, uh, courteous, friendly, I mean, you name it, you know, uh, reliable, you know. And uh, unless you had that experience or that education, you never really knew that, you know. And people's perception of those who are unhoused you know, um, could change, you know, could be changed. And with that, there could be more compassion, more understanding, you know. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if there's anything as far as the, you know, part of the plan to educate the public, either using, you know, radio or television or print ads uh, to, to let people know what, you know, and then some stories from people who are, you know, going through what they're going through, you know. Um, to, to appeal to the humanity that we, you know, all have. Um, sure, we don't 
don't have anything like that per se. However, we do have um, a number of opportunities and volunteer opportunities for in, for people to engage with those that are unhoused. That could also help provide some of that um, some of that perspective. Volunteering at the Egan Warming Centers during the cold nights in the winter would be one example. of Volunteering at the Mission and and other um, areas that are serving the unhoused, we do recommend. Um, I like the ideas that you have, and so it's definitely something I think we should consider. Um, we do also um, again part of our intent of engaging with those that are unhoused as we develop what our services should be is to also um, create opportunities for um, engagement with those individuals so again being able to go do outreach um, on the streets etc that can also create really good positive experiences for people and so um, but I do as far as like a public campaign we don't necessarily have that in place but I like the idea Um, also, uh, we are looking at inviting Melinda in to talk about the police part of that communication as well. Right. Um, we've got about 15, 10, 15 minutes left in this discussion piece. Uh, if anybody else has any other questions. Otherwise, thank you so much for coming in. Great. Thank you, Wayne. Good to see you. Okay. Thank you. So. Thank you. Great. Well, appreciate the work you do. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I do. Okay. Good. Sweet. So, <laughs> we do have a final draft review on the docket, but we don't have quorum, so we're not going to be able to do that tonight. Uh, and it looks like we can move on to the police report. Thank you um, very much. Uh, it's always nice to go a little bit deeper into the into the agenda because as I listen to whether it's public comments or commissioners questions I kind of make a running list of things that I'd like to um, also say besides some thoughts that I had about where your police department is uh, is right now and so I'm going to pick a few of those off because I think um, and thank you for those of you that had comments or sticking around because sometimes what happens is comments are made and then they leave and and we don't have an opportunity to actually share some information that I think hope is hopefully helpful mm -hmm. sure sure and so I know it's really tough because they want to be engaged and they can and so this is a way to kind of um, help them feel a little more engaged so thanks for sticking around um, I appreciate that um, first and foremost um, uh, Becky did a great job of explaining uh, how the fire department has created space for the Conestoga huts but I'd like to point out that it's actually the police department that purchased them all <laughs> and so <laughs> and so while we appreciate our fire service partners actually freeing up parking spaces in their uh, park in their parking lot it was actually your police department that had the uh, took the leadership role from the front and found money to purchase nine Conestoga huts so that we could um, find the right individuals with some case management to be stabilized and we feel strongly about wanting to continue to, to <clears throat> lead from the front on that so kind of a fun little jab at our folks at the fire department to, to get that um, the illegal camping um, the the concept and the and the issues around the illegal camping I know are really really contentious right now and there's a lot of dialogue as you can imagine on both sides of, of illegal camping and what illegal camping is in the city of Eugene and, and what it is we do when it comes to that violation of illegal camping and a, a, just a, a reminder that it is a violation which is not a criminal offense uh, much like a, a traffic violation would be um, and so it, be, it has a tendency to be a little bit discretionary and so people often talk to me chief why would why do your officers either choose to or choose not to issue a citation for illegal camping and I think the point was made and I appreciate that Lindsay I think you're the one that made it is that it's a complaint driven process that we don't have police officers driving around looking for people that may meet the criteria for illegal camping and then stopping and engaging them in some kind of an enforcement action it is it is complaint driven because as you have found out as you've been on this commission we are so busy with so many other criminal types of, of things that we're doing is that we certainly do not have the, the discretionary time to be doing that nor would we uh, in a situation uh, in a situation like that um, I did a, I, I asked myself the question though I wanted to know in a snapshot what did what did the illegal camping environment look like uh, in, in as far as enforcement or our interaction in Eugene and so uh, what first thing I did is is I is I ask uh, crime analytics to find out um, what what is our point in time count in Eugene with regards to uh, adults that are unsheltered uh, and this also includes those that are in the in the 
the mission or in some kind of safe spot because they're still considered uh, unsheltered. And the number that, that we had at the time in Eugene was thir about 1,350. Now we can argue about if that's more, if that's less, but it's kind of like the census is we do the very best to kind of get a snapshot of how many that is. Um, and so from August of 2018 through August of 2019, the Eugene Police Department issued 268 citations for illegal camping out of 1,350 unsheltered individuals. Uh, what's I'm sorry? Did you get the money? We, no, we can't. No. We can't. <laughs> There's no money associated for the Eugene Police Department. Sorry, can you repeat so, that number for me? So 268 Thank citations. Thank you. Um, and so of the 268 citations, that represented 151 individuals. So you see some individuals are receiving more than one citation. And the, and the piece that I thought was really interesting is that 18 individuals of that 151 accounted for 41% of all the citations. And so it really is a uh, somewhat of a focus group that has a can has a, a tendency to uh, to generate uh, lots and lots of complaints where we have to go back over and over and over again when I did a heat map of where that was occurring we found some similarities in where that's occurring that are, are around certain pockets of the downtown core fifth and high the, uh, the location behind uh, Whole Foods, 11th and Lincoln. And so it has a tendency to have kind of the, some of the same people that are moving to different spots and camps that are generating a lot of complaints by people, uh, both calling and writing and uh, stopping by and all of these things that are generating those citations. So I wanted to give the commission just some high level perspective on, on kind of what the landscape of, of our enforcement actions are around um, illegal camping. Um, one of the things that wasn't suggested I think is important for the Commission to understand or, or, or be aware of, or maybe is aware of but wasn't um, talked about, is the tremendous partnership and valuable partnership we have with CAHOOTS and how we, cho we choose to call them in to help us deal with folks uh, that aren't engaging in criminal behavior but just need uh, maybe a calming face and a calming voice to get them to services, whether it's a, a, a ride to the Buckley House, a ride to St. Vincent's, uh, a ride to their doctor's appointment, uh, and just to try and get them stabilized. Um, the police department spends $1.6 million a year on our CAHOOTS contract. Mm -hmm. So there is a strong commitment there to understanding that we want to match the resource uh, with the need. We know we have a need. We want to match the right resource with that need. And the wrong resource is taking our law enforcement professionals and asking them to respond to that need. I've often said we want to have behavioral health first responders go to behavioral health issues, not police first responders going to behavioral health issues. So we're working uh, strongly on that. And then the other thing that I think is really a success for us when we think about the expansion of CORT, C-O-R-T, Community Outreach Response Team, is also recognizing the success that we're seeing with Community Court, which is offering deferral options for people that when arrested for some low-level criminal behavior in the downtown core, they have an option to be able to go through Community Court and be able to uh, get to a better place and head in the right direction and not be held um, accountable criminally for their behavior. And so that's a really, really good program that I think when we talk about expanding things, that's certainly something on my radar screen to do something other than just in the downtown core because we see those types of behaviors citywide, not just in the downtown core. But it's voluntary. And that's one of the challenges that we have, whether we talk about shelter that space that we have available, uh, whether it's 75 more or, or 350 more supportive housing, uh, it, it's all voluntary. People have to choose to want to go there, and we certainly cannot make them. We're not going to take a custody. We're not going to deprive somebody of their civil liberties, take them into custody, and force them to go to shelter. We offer that as a resource and certainly can arrange for a ride for them and their things to get to shelter. And again, that's where CAHOOTS really comes in because they do a great job of helping transport those individuals instead of uh, a ride in a patrol car, which is not appropriate for many, for many of those things. Um, real quickly, uh, Silver, you mentioned uh, the 75 bed uh, uh, potential emergency shelter. I know that it uh, sometimes it feels like it's a tent. We have a great partner in town uh, by the name of Western Shelter that sets up uh, mobile hospitals all over the world um, and are actually are, are, are have infrastructure where they actually are able to do surgery in a clean and sterile environment. It's those kinds of structures we're talking about. So we're trying to be mindful of, of putting something up that actually is meaningful that can, can uh, be there for more more than 
a month at a time and that people can feel some sense of ownership and pride where they're at for as they get stabilized I um, only say tent because I heard the City Council say tent yeah and that's a problem I'm trying to we're trying to change that vernacular a little bit because it feels like a tent uh, but we're trying to we're actually trying to change that vernacular a little bit because I do think it's a little bit more robust than what most people think of when they think tent uh, and certainly what most people think of when they think of illegal camping in the tents they see on the on the planning strip or, or or in and around town, it's certainly not that environment. Yeah. So we're we're trying to be trying to be mindful. I, I pictured a year. Huh? So I pictured a year. Yeah, and and even the Conestoga so. huts are, are interesting because yeah. they you know they you know we uh, we built one together over at, at one of the the Christian church down here, and it's they're they're actually they're insulated. They've got hard floor. They do a nice job of, of creating a safe space for yeah. somebody to kind of get stabilized. So thank you for letting indulging me and let me just think about some things that I that I wrote down as, as I was hearing comments and, and hearing all of your great questions and so I do appreciate that. From your police department perspective, um, I often report kind of what we're doing and and, and where we're headed. Um, we're seeing some great successes uh, from the street crimes team has written some great search warrants and done some investigations that are taking tremendous amount of guns off the street. You may have seen recently a search warrant that was served that took 70 guns off out of our community. Uh, seven or eight of them were fully automatic with silencers, methamphetamine, and, and uh, uh, money. Um, that's one of those things that you can't ever say what you may have prevented by doing that. But certainly in this day and age with the gun violence that's going on in this country, we want to pay attention to that. And we want to pay attention to, to doing good investigations and trying to get guns off the street. And so we're, we're very proud of the, of the good work that's being done there. We're very much in the planning stages for uh, the community safety initiative and how that payroll tax is going to be administered and, and when we get to start hiring more people that actually are going to bring some relief to the system. Um, and so between now and when that time comes, and we're still working on, on when that time comes, we're changing some things around with the way, and specifically the commission may be interested in knowing how we're going to try to deliver training a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. um, right now our training is a training sergeant and a single officer trying to deliver training. Uh, we've hired 60 new police officers in the last two years just because of attrition and vacancies and we, we don't have any more police officers necessarily we just have cycled so many of those I don't even know the names of these baby cops running around in my hallways so we're, we're trying to keep up but we need to do training differently because when we think about hiring that many people in a short period of time training is the key to serving a community effectively and we understand that we're young and we understand that we're going to get younger and we're going to understand we understand that sometimes we're going to make young mistakes uh, just like anybody just like raising kids or having a business or having young employees we're going to make young mistakes the key is is that we train them well enough that what those mistakes aren't critical fatal uh don't you know don't alter someone's life or the officer's lives or fellow officer's lives with bad decision making so the, the little mistakes we can we can make but we want to deliver training a little differently so we're going to um, actually I'm gonna move some things around and assign a lieutenant to training with a sergeant and we're gonna actually we're gonna actually select full-time trainers if that's their full-time job is to pay attention to the training of officers the training of professional staff and also be able to pay attention to uh, through some early warning and some uh, you know our relationship with the auditor is so strong that we're able to see which officers are kind of making some of the same mistakes over and over again and 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 talking about kind of the early warning system and whether it's a training issue and have the resources to actually grab that person and say all right this is a training issue this isn't a this isn't a mistake of the heart this is maybe a mistake of the head and just being young let's 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 uh, um, let's get them trained and so uh, and so we're looking at we're looking at how we can train uh, differently in the police department so that we make sure that as we hire them that we can we get the people um, fully trained so that's that's one of the one of the things that we're we're going to be really wor working on um, with respect to that and then there's a, a variety of other things we're doing but it's it's just all to get set up for the CSI community safety initiative because for the next three years when we say okay ready go for the next three years my job with this team that I'm trying to build is to build a police department that this community has never seen before in the way of how it can meet the needs of this community and so it's a it's a transformational time for this PD and and I want to be measured about how we grow we grow too fast it's going to be a bad deal we want to be measured about how we grow but we also know um, 
there are so many people out there that are experiencing a lack of response or untimely response or just needing officers to be in their neighborhoods for no good reason other than just to be in their neighborhoods and interacting. We're trying to get there, so we're trying to be mindful of trying to get to that as soon as we can without growing too fast. So that's my report. Thank you. What's your name? Silver? Yeah, so you mentioned the payroll tax. Um, how much of the funding is going to be going to CAHOOTS? And I, like you, appreciate the work that they're doing. Mm -hmm. That, you know, I see them all the time. Right. Um, just helping out with people that are going mm -hmm. through a crisis. Mm -hmm. um, does that funding get funneled through the, the EPD, or does it get funneled through just the, right. the as, it, as it comes out? So the, so the contract for CAHOOTS <laughs> resides with EPD. So that money resides within my budget and we execute the contract with, with CAHOOTS. Um, we, um, right now, there's a, uh, there's a portion of the CAHOOTS contract that is operating with one-time money. And so with the CSI, what we're hoping to do is stabilize that and make that an ongoing thing. What we do is every, we, every year we recognize they're hugely valuable. Yeah. And every year what we say is I need money to expand it. And yeah. but it's a one-time year in year out type of, of, of ask. What we want to do is get to it where it's just part of the landscape. So are you going to just fund it? Is that going to be increased? No, the 1.6 is where we're at right now. As a matter of fact, we, we, CAHOOTS is not expanding their services and I've got money I'm sitting on because they can't hire the staff to do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, operationally, and I talked to Kate Gillespie just recently last week and she's, she looks at me and she's like, just be patient with us. We're doing, because I'm like, Kate, let's do this. Yeah. Let's ready, I'm, I'm ready to go. Yeah. And, and they're just, they're, they're struggling like many people are with just staffing issues, but they're really committed to getting that staff to a place where we have two vans in Eugene running almost 24 hours a day yeah both bands seven days a week and that that will be good but right now they're not quite there yet right okay thank you mm -hmm. chief last meeting uh, at the last meeting you mentioned that some of the new hires are, are you know lateral hire mm -hmm. new hires uh, so out of the 15 how many of those were lateral new hires out of the 15 15 new hire that you mentioned is male uh, uh, I don't remember. I, I, I mentioned that we've hired 60 over the last oh, couple 60, of years. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, we've got groups of 15, um, <laughs> and so it's not okay. a, it's not a false statement. We've certainly <laughs> done that. I've got 11 right now in the police academy getting ready to graduate next month, and so we've had some big hiring groups. We try to keep a balance between new police officers and lateral officers. I can't build a police department with brand new cops having a have them all be brand new cops and I affectionately call them baby cops so I don't they and they know that so they're not offended by that but we need to find um, we need to find lateral officers as well that have some experience and some life experience to help balance that and we've done really really well with with uh, lateral officers I, I I don't know specifically the ratio but I, I bet it's a two-third to one-third ratio one-third ratio of lateral officers to help kind of balance that out and what's nice about lateral officers especially ones that are from the state is is that they can come in and almost immediately help with what we have going on they've got some things to learn some policies to learn the computer system where the bathroom is you know those types of things but but they don't but but they come already really uh, well um, well trained in most cases uh, and they're ready to they're ready to kind of hit the ground running and so that's an important strategy for us is to make sure we have a good balance between lateral and entry-level police officers okay thank you Lindsay? So I'm curious about, um, is it difficult to recruit new officers? What are your demographic compositions mm -hmm. like looking like now with so many new officers and what's kind of the washout rate when you bring yeah, people on? Yeah, great questions. Um, and I'm not gonna have those at my fingertips, sure. but anecdotally <laughs> I'm just gonna give you kind of some, some rough time. numbers. I'm gonna just some swag. So to answer your first question, we have had no dis no difficulty rec recruiting officers. And I, and I, and it's, and I, I feel bad saying that because I'm, I have my colleagues around the state who are not experiencing that. Right. For some reason, in Eugene right now, this is the place to be. And I don't know what that's about, but we will open a process for 10 days and we'll have 100 people apply. We have to shut it down and test them. And we've had some great officers come through. We've had DPSST, which is the Department of Public Safety Standards and Training, which is the police academy, up in Salem, call us over the last two classes, call us and say these are some of the best recruits they've seen. And so we're, we're really, really 
very blessed and fortunate to be able to recruit uh, officers doing that. Um, we demographically, we're always striving to be stronger. We're not where um, we're not where I'm, I'm not sure you ever identify where you feel comfortable with your demographics. But what I will say is that we we constantly and purposefully try to recruit. Um, to, to build the most diverse organization we can. And when I talk about diversity, it's, it's beyond gender and ethnic diversity for me. It's, it's diversity of experiences, life experiences. Um, we just make better decisions when we have just, a, just a, you know, men and women of all different backgrounds and races and colors and experiences and ages um, and, um, and challenges that they've been through in their life. And so we try to do that. So I do have some demographic numbers that, that uh, Melinda, uh, actually Melinda pulled for me this week on a story that Chelsea Deffenbacher is doing, um, but I don't have those memorized, but I'm happy to send them to you. It gives us our entire department and where we're at for gender and ethnic diversity. If you're interested in that, Lindsay, I'm happy to send that to you. I would also really love it if you could break it down by like kind of uh, years in, so you can see the change over time. So for example, if you've got 50 people with one year in, if oh, that's sure. possible. Like trend analysis yeah. of over the years, how we've done exactly. with diversity and if it's gone up or down yeah. or state static. I'll see what I can do. HR is the one that'll do the heavy lift on mm -hmm. that, so I'll see if they can <laughs> they can do with that. What I found interesting though is we're, we are uh, right now about um, half of our department, so there's, three, there's 330 total FTE in the police department. That includes sworn professional staff, dispatchers, I mean it's everybody. Um, about almost exactly half of them are over 40 and exactly half are under. We're right in the middle of, the, of that kind of line. And so, uh, but, but I will tell you that the under 40, um, most of those are residing in patrol and your police officers just because we're so young right sure. now. Yeah. So. Thank you. So I've got Amanda and then myself. So um, I just was wondering if you could briefly explain the difference between court, CORT, and community court. I hear them conflated in yeah. the community a lot. Wanna, we're going to try and change the name. We, we started to try and change the name of court, C-O-R-T, because of this. You, yeah. Everybody gets confused when we do that. I got confused. I, I had to ask, which court are we talking about? So the community outreach response team is more of a multidisciplinary team that goes out to our highest frequency offenders to try, and the whole point is to try and reduce recidivism and try to get identify those those individuals that have a tendency to be either in the criminal justice system or on the radar screen over and over and over and over again and kind of go out there and see if there's something we can do to provide an off-ramp so that they can they can get to a place where they're making either better decisions or have some level of housing or some services that help them move that direction. Community court is actually a def uh, uh, kind of a restorative justice model of a court, an actual court held at the library, where a judge, if you're arrested for a, a qualifying crime, which are very low level nuisance crime, disorderly conduct, trespass, uh, maybe you know open container of some sort in the downtown core, that you can uh, go to court, community court and be offered an opportunity to um, engage in services, do some community service, and stay on kind of a program to be able to get to a place of wellness in lieu of the traditional criminal justice system. And that's another off-ramp is to try and find something other than the traditional criminal justice system to get people help. So one's kind of a team environment, more of like a strike team to go out and help those individuals. And court is kind of a, a catch basin for those that want to um, avail themselves of a restorative justice model instead of the, the, the traditional criminal justice model. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so for my question, it was, um, so point of information, Melinda is Melinda McLaughlin, uh, Public Information Officer for EPD. Um, and the question I had was whether it would be useful for everybody if we took a meeting, put it on the agenda about looking at this new training process and how you're adapting it. Um, so Sure. Well, I think uh, it's probably, if, you're, if there's some interest, um, it's in development now, but um, we could have the uh, deputy chief come as a guest. Um, she is the one that's, uh, that's leading that and talk a little bit about her vision for how to deliver training uh, and how to have kind of a more tr robust training um, function within the organization. So we're happy to, we're happy to, to roll that out. It's a, it, like I said, it's a work in progress right now. So we give us a little bit of time to fully develop. I think it's a more um, 
I think it's a, a more productive conversation once we kind of work out the kinks. Okay. Um, but um, yeah, we're happy to do that anytime. So the, that sound like something everybody's interested in? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so we have, uh, thank you so mm -hmm. much for your report. Thank you. Always appreciate how thorough you are in answering the questions. Mm -hmm. um, Long-winded. <laughs> <laughs> um, next we've got the uh, illegal camping recap. With Mason, which we can't vote on anything. This is a deliberation. Okay. Uh, then that moves us right into the diversity, equity, and inclusion discussion. So uh, at our last, is this also a deliberation? Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much the rest of it. Okay. Yes. Sorry. No. Um, uh, May I ask a question about Please. this this policy? I won't. It's just a clarifying question. Yeah. Uh, so policy 410, 410 the definition of prohibited camping looks like it's directly lifted just from the city ordinance. Is that accurate? Okay. Thank you. Yep. That's all. Um, all right. So ne our next meeting. Uh, do you have a question? Yeah, why, why, so why can't we discuss these, the diversity and equity? We don't have quorum. Without a, so the, the intent of that topic was to discuss what the police commission wanted to do with that topic moving forward. Oh. It was, it was brought up at the retreat right. and I brought your, leadership, it your leadership was hoping to have a little bit more clarification as to what kinds of speakers, things like that, they would want, oh. but the discussion of where we would want to go would be a deliberation and without a quorum. We can't ha have an official meeting. So um, our next meeting is going to be at Peterson Barn at 817 uh, Burnson Road on November the 14th. And um, I will try to just move that diversity, equity, and inclusion um, topic. I won't be there. Oh, no. Uh, maybe, maybe two meetings. But um, That's a proxy. I'll, we'll take a look at the agenda. <laughs> the reason that is on the agenda at all is because we, it's on our work plan. It's something that we yeah. really value and want to do. Yeah. And we just need to figure out what that looks like. If, if you have some comments and topics yeah. about that, and you, or you know you're not going to be here, uh, yeah, why don't you go ahead and email them to me, and I'll bring them to the commission on your behalf. Um, the community outreach update, just so everybody knows what it is, uh, in a similar vein of diversity, one of our goals is to reach out to various members of the community. So each month uh, we try to get out and participate in community events and um, bring back community feedback about what's going on in their area and what their concerns are with police policy. Um, so, so, so we're on the right foot. I have not done much of that. Um, can we take a report about it, what everybody's up to around the community, though? Uh, as far as just yeah, yeah, sweet. So, if you've been to a community event of the last month, um, please share. I'm con I'm a little confused. Mm -hmm. You know, the first meeting that I participated in, in this commission, I thought we weren't sure if we we're going to continue doing the outreach, and there were no, um, you know, finality to that conversation. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then I know that we went to the Pride, you know, event. Um, but then, is there any like sign up? How do how do we divvy up this whole list? I mean, would be more advantageous than to all of us going to every single one of these, you know, outreaches, you know, yep. um, you know, divide and conquer kind of mentality here. Um, so is there any like uh, so decision on this? Last year at about the same time, we had sort of a completionist model of outreach. It, for a variety of reasons, sort of fell apart from lack of input. Um, so I think Going forward, the way we want to do this is just to, um, it's, as part of the ordinance that establishes the police commission, it's our job to reach out to the community. Um, so as commissioners, I'm trusting you all to uh, go to neighborhood meetings, go to you know, coffee with your neighbors, or really a more ad hoc version of the same goal. Um, so far, I 
you know, Silver has acted in a variety of ways. You and I both went to Pride. Um, Terry, I believe you volunteered at the library, right? Mm -hmm. So that's sort of just ways in which your role as a commissioner has been brought up in your community activities. Which reminds me, and this is totally off the cuff, or maybe, but the library just started tutoring again for people who have language issues or adult literacy issues or want to learn about citizenship. And it just started this past, it'll be Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday. So you can find out from the library and pass that word around to people you know if they need, uh, if they have issues with it, where they need tutoring. There was six of us there on Monday. I'll so do a PSA on the radio. Okay, very good. <laughs> All right. Uh, um, yeah, we can't deliberate about what we want it to look like since we don't have a quorum, but I know you're all engaged and energetic folks. So just wanted to remind everybody of those goals that we've got. And with that, let's move on to closing comments. Go the same way around. Well, nothing good. Amanda? Um, I don't really have anything just other than I'm really excited to be here. And thank you for having me. Learn a lot every single meeting. <laughs> yeah, I, I really appreciate you know hearing from uh, the audience coming in and making their comments, and then to to hear from the chief, to you know hear from uh, you know uh, Becky from the division, um, uh, you know on on the, on the ordinance that we discussed earlier, and I you know my mind is just full of information, and I really appreciate all of you. You know, speak on different different topics and items. Thank you. Um, Becky mentioned the Egan Warming Center as an opportunity for us to do some outreach and do some work. <coughs> I used to work with Chief Kearns here. My wife worked with Chief Kearns mm -hmm. at the Egan uh, opportunities. So I would, would suggest that maybe if you had an opportunity to sit in and do some of that at some point I know you got a family and so it's different but um, yeah it, it sounds was, like a challenge to me so <laughs> yeah I challenge you <laughs> um, it's overnight you know but it, I remember she would share with her uh, she would share with me stories of, of stuff that took place at the Egan outreach and it's we're getting there again it's gonna be cold are going to be people sleeping on the streets, and um, we just need to keep in mind that they're dealing with things that we don't necessarily have to deal with because we have a place of shelter that keeps us, you know, warm. So, yeah, um, I welcome conversations about dealing with the homeless issues and any conversation or you know uh, comments that are. You know, from the um, public, I, I, I welcome that and I appreciate that. I know that something needs to be done. So please continue to do that. I agree, like many things need to be done. I appreciate the people that are here and who made comment. I'm sorry, Wayne's not here. I always love hearing from him. Um, thank you for a well-organized meeting and if I have the pleasure of being actually appointed, I'll read my packet before arriving. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> thank you. And, um, yeah, I'm excited by all the new faces. I am excited for what we're going to do over the next year um, and what we're going to do at next at the next meeting, which is again at the Peterson Barn on the 14th. Um, thank you, everybody who came and made public comments. Um, thanks for being respectful throughout. Um, if you still have comments or want to give us more feedback, um, and you have an email, you can send an email to Jeremy, who I will provide an email address for in a minute. And if you don't have an email, uh, we can write it down and he can send it out by email to the totality of the commissioners, um, I believe. Yeah, yeah our, the email is, is uh, on the police commission website. So just Eugene Police Commission and the contact information is right there, the email address. Send it to me and I'll be sure to get it to the commission. Sweet. And other than that, um, we're out an hour early. Thank you all. Can I take this? Sure, take yeah, some. Great. <laughs> well, durians I've always wanted to try. Oh, really? Yeah. I've never bought it at the.